Hello, welcome to Robinson Hall Experts Talk and today we're going to be discussing renewable energy projects. So I've got um, Polly Saul and Andrew Jenkinson with me. They're both partners and rural surveyors. They're involved in all aspects of rural property services, including valuations, estate management, landlord and tenant matters, support schemes, development and renewable energy. Welcome, Andrew and Polly. Hi. Hi. What renewable energy options are you seeing on farms? It really breaks into two. There's the small scale on farm generation projects, such as solar on people's farm buildings and small wind turbines, and then there's the larger inf more infrastructure led projects which we're seeing a lot of at present, such as large scale solar, batteries and wind. And what land area do these projects cover? So the solar can be big or very big, so a typical solar farm scheme will vary between 50 and 200 acres or it'd be over a thousand acres. The difference is because of the grid connection cost and the planning process. Battery schemes are smaller area in terms of they might be three or four acres or they can be up to about 20 acres and these are what looks like containers on the land. The wind turbines are we saw in 20, up to 2013, before the Conservatives changed the policy. There's been a lot of offshore wind built in England since, but onshore wind is beginning to come back. And these projects will be much bigger than we saw last time. Typically last time the projects were for a 100 metre tip height for the wind turbine. This time they'll be 200 metres, but they still only take up the sort of same land area on the base of a few acres for each turbine. Is there like a minimum amount of uh, acres that you need for the renewable energy options? For the large scale projects, then there's a minimum of about 50 acres for solar. Right. For wind, it will be a few turbines, probably five. And for battery, it's about three or four acres. So why is there an increase all of a sudden in these projects? So it's mainly led from sort of government policy for net zero strategies, which has led to a bigger focus on renewable energy projects. Um, obviously, we've had a new Labour government in recent weeks and they've set even bigger targets than the Conservatives had. So they're looking to double onshore wind, treble solar and quadruple offshore wind by 2030. And they're also looking at uh, energy storage solutions, so bigger focus on batteries. And there's going to be an added pressure because they're going to take away uh, new licenses for oil and coal projects and also right. get rid of fracking, which keeps coming back and going away and coming back. But they say they will make a, a permanent ban. So I think we're going to keep seeing these projects grow. So do you think because the government have obviously got these um, kind of ideas in place, that there'll be incentivizations for farmers? I don't know if we'll see it come back. We saw it in the past with... Feed and tariffs. Yeah. But the, with the price of electricity and the price of the panels and turbines have come down so much, they don't need to incentivize to make it work anymore. Okay. So if you're considering um, looking at renewable energy options on your land, what are the key considerations before deciding whether to move forward? Yeah, I mean, it's a big step for people to, to go into one of these projects. And the first thing really to think about is the impact on the farm. So where will the project go? How will it sit? Is it close to, to buildings or does it ruin the shoot? Does it impact on how you're, you know, you're going to be able to farm going forward? There's then you need to think about tax because the land will no lo longer be agricultural. So it will take you out of the agricultural property relief for inheritance tax. And there's also things like negativity from neighbours and the local you know, people. There can be a lot of opposition to these type of projects and it is quite a big factor for people to think, do they want to, to put themselves into that position where they can get that flak? And then there's other things like, does it impact on environmental schemes and things like that? But those are probably the main things from a landowner perspective. From a developer's perspective, it will be about the grid offer. These projects tend to be located close to substations, 
the UK energy grid was designed around a few big coal-fired power stations, many of them in the north, and transporting energy from the north to the south. It wasn't designed for lots of smaller connections to all spread across the country in order to fulfil the energy needs of the country. So the grid will be the trip chief driver for the developer and then it will be such things as landscape and suitability for planning. Grid you'll hear a lot about on these projects. Currently many projects don't have a connection date until well into the 2030s. Sometimes up to 2037 I think is the longest one I've heard so far. Don't, don't plan retiring on the funding yet I think is what we keep telling people. Yeah and so we, yeah, the option agreements for people need to be for a long time. It's an unusual project. Normally, most development work we get involved in, planning is always the biggest challenge. Whereas at the moment it is the national grid and their ability to take the power. Although that may be changing over the next few months. What do you mean by that? Why, why do you think it might change? The national grid are looking at the way they allocate the sites. Currently it's a first in, first come serve basis. So if you're in a few years ago you'll have an earlier connection date. That might not mean that project is actually moving forward. Right. So they're looking at changing it so that those projects which have got planning got and are ready to basically start to be built, can be built, so that they can connect into the grid first. So I know that many landowners often kind of receive letters in the post um, from various sources, but mainly from possibly a developer proposing a renewable energy and project on their land. What advice would you give to any landowner that's received a letter? It would be to seek professional advice. We've got some clients who've had 20, 30 letters. Most clients seem to have had a letter now. Quite often these com some of these companies and little more than one person in the room writing to you. So seek professional advice, speak to your land agent, speak to a specialist solicitor but also do your research, think about who you're actually partnering with. We tend to work with some of the larger European developers, quite often they're owned by one of the uh, European government, or someone who's got a real track record in this country of bringing these projects forward. One of the biggest sort of worries we have is that, that some of these companies are sort of land banking, so they're putting together lots, getting lots of landowners in, and some of their projects won't be deliverable. So it is sort of knowing who the players are and, you know, are they respected? Have they got funding? Have they got legitimate backers that, that can actually bring a project forward? So I think it's fair to say then don't kind of get excited when you get the letter necessarily because it might not be as it seems. No, so I think always. spend the time looking at it. Yeah. You know, if every solar farm that we've we've been approached for for clients got built, we, we wouldn't have much of the country left, you know. The, yeah. They are looking everywhere. And not all of the projects will come forward. There's currently over 300 gigawatts of connection opportunities being submitted to the National Grid. We only need 100 of 100 gigawatts, or just over. So there's three times too much already. But some of them will fall away. But it's just be really careful about who you're working with. Will they get on with planning? Will they spend the money? And do you think they'll actually deliver the project? If they're not actually going to build out the project, that's not a problem. It's quite common once the planning permission has been gained for these projects to be sold on, as they're all special purchase vehicles, so they're all companies, individual companies, each project. What we don't want is someone who's just going to sit on it and do nothing and tie your land up. And what are the timescales involved? I think it really it all comes down to the grid. To agree heads of terms and to put in the option agreement in place whereby you give a certain period of time to the developer to gain planning consent and grid connection. In exchange you agree to enter into a lease with them if they meet those milestones then you're looking at a period of between three and 15 years. It right. all depends on the grid. They, they, all of the option agreements will have sort of long stop dates built in, but a lot of those will be dependent on planning. So there will be options for the developers to extend those agreements should they have got a planning application pending or be looking at a review or, you know, or waiting on good connection. So when a client approaches us 
possibly interested in various options, is one of the first stages to consider planning? Generally, we consider the terms that have been put forward. The, the planning we actually do leave up to, to the developers, except you want to make sure that it's built into the terms of conditions where they do have to be moving forward with that planning application. It needs to be sensible in terms of planning. You know, is it a viable location or not? What's its destinations, etc.? Once terms are agreed, the developer will need to do a whole load of surveys. For solar, they tend to be six to nine months, but for the onshore wind, they'll need at least two years' worth of bird surveys. So there's quite a lot of survey work to do before you can even go for a pre application advice. So, what are the key terms that landowners should be looking out for? I think most people look immediately at the rent, uh, but these are really long term agreements. And a few hundred pounds here or there per acre on the rent is perhaps not the be all and end all. It was obviously a key consideration for people, but there are lots of other things that you need to look at. Um, you know, you, you, we often see different terms for, say, environmental areas that will need to be built into a scheme. You know, what, how, will there be a rent reduction on those areas? Is there a limit on how much the landowner, the, the developer can have? Things like the reinstatement provision. So what happens at the end of the lease? What happens if the developer goes bust? And things like indemnities and insurances to make sure that the landowner is protected should you know, the worst happen. I think there's also, it's important to look at you know, the siting of the, the, where it's going to go. What's the impact on the rest of the farm? Because there'll be limitations on building or planting trees within a certain area of those solar panels or batteries, how yeah. does that impact on the rest of the farm? Mm. Each project's different, but solar rents tend to now be in the region of 1000 to £1,200 per acre, plus an upside if there's a higher turnover than expected. Batteries can seem very attractive on a per acre basis because they're often paying up to £2,000 a megawatt for the connection. So if you've got a 50 megawatt import, capacity then it can be a rent of a hundred thousand for a few acres. Onshore wind is still very much in its infancy again but because the turbines are so much bigger we're looking at rents well over fifty thousand pounds per turbine potentially. So there's very attractive rents to be had. Yeah as Polly says it's not all about the rent because it has a dramatic effect if you're doing it purely to for the rent, then you need to be considering is it the best thing for your business or are there other drivers there? Okay. And is the cost of the works payable by the landowner or the developer? So all the planning, professional fees, survey work etc will be covered by the developer up to a certain point. It's important to make sure from early on though that any costs that you are running up with your agent or solicitor will be covered even if the project doesn't proceed. It's very common on housing developers that the developer covers costs if you don't sign that option agreement, but it's far less so with renewable projects. So just be cautious that when you're talking to developers and you're running up costs, you may end up liable if you decide to pull out for any reason. I think another thing to factor in that we're increasingly seeing is sort of including accountancy and other professional advice costs because a lot of these schemes do lead to sort of needing to restructure businesses or or set up separate companies to run them through and you know it's factoring those sorts of costs in as well. Essentially try and get everything covered from the beginning. So how can Robinson Hall help if anyone's um, wanting to find out more or they've got some land that they think would be suitable? We've been involved in a lot of projects. We were involved in the first rush of solar up to 2012 where we went and gained planning permission for the largest solar farm in the country at that time over in Oxfordshire. Now we're involved in a lot of option agreements between Polly and I and we're dealing with over 30 schemes at present. Wow. And it's really important that you consider everything in these projects and seek professional advice. The difference in terms between the good developers and the bad developers aren't often clear from the start. It's about having that track record and money to spend. And people need to be thinking through, this is a multi-generational project. 
That's why when Polly talks about the yielding up provisions, whereby the sites are cleared at the end in 30, 40, 50 years, that's one of the most crucial clauses, because potentially you could have a scheme which you have to end up clearing up, which could have wipe out all the advantages you've had in terms of the rent. So the importance over those reinstatement provisions can't be underestimated. Yeah, and there are quite a lot of different ways that the developers are sort of putting forward the options for reinstatement. So I think the benefit of having a professional is that we've seen most of those different options that have been put forward in the past. Yeah, and so we know quite, you what know, to look we, out for. Yeah, we're used to dealing with the solicitors on those sorts of terms and, you know, we've just got the experience of seeing what works and what doesn't. So, Andrew Jenkinson, you touched on battery storage. Can you just give me a bit more detail on exactly what battery storage is? So, batteries are all put in a container. In any solar scheme, there will be a small amount of batteries, which is for load shifting, whereby they'll produce power in the middle of the day in sun at 5pm, because it'll be at a higher rate per megawatt. Back Battery schemes on their own, though, are different. They're about importing electricity, storing it, and then selling it. So they will tend to buy energy out, out of the grid in, in the middle of the night, when wind turbines, for example, are still turning, store it, and then sell it at peak periods. Okay. And we've talked um, a lot about the options available, but what about the process? Um, can you talk me through the process? Yes. So generally, um, when a landowner gets an approach from a developer, they often approach in the first instance for what's called an exclusivity agreement. So a period of, say, six months, 12 months, even up to 18 months, where they can explore the planning, explore whether the project's feasible, and the landowner's agreeing that they won't talk to any other solo developers, say, in that period. If... um, during the exclusivity period, we're usually working on heads of terms for an option. So an option gives the developer the right to take a lease at a later date. So it gives them, say, five years, six years, could be longer, to go out, get planning. And if they get planning, they can then serve notice on the landowner that says, under our option, we now want to enter into a lease. OK. So you've talked about the key terms and what landowners should look out for, but what are the risks involved Pre the lease being taken out, the risk is that your developer doesn't actually get on and gain planning consent and proceed with the project. So you'd be under an option agreement with them, but you'd be prevented from actually doing anything else whilst the option period runs. Once planning's gained the group and the lease is up and running, the major risk as we see it is about the project going bust for some reason, whether it be a fire or that whichever that technology just becomes unfeasible moving forward. And that's where the reinstatement bond or insurance policy comes in and about what happens at the end of the lease, which is why it's so crucial. The other thing that just needs to be kept in mind is we do have a bit of concern with the country's energy provision being provided by lots of small solar farms, wind turbines, etc. spread across the country. This all becomes national infrastructure. And so does it go the way the same way long term in terms of like the mobile phone masks, where actually the government steps in, forces renewals and potentially reduces the rent? Let's hope not. I was going to say, we don't know if that's going to happen, but you know, it is a potential risk that I think landowners just need to be aware of. And the fact is, these are such long schemes that if something's been under batteries for 40 years, at the end of the term of the existing lease, is it really going to be feasible for it to not be batteries anymore? You know, we always build in the reinstatement provisions so that it has to be put back to agricultural or whatever it was to start with, but realistically, will that happen in, in 40 years' time? We just don't know. Is it possible once you've got kind of got a heads of terms, it's all been signed and sealed, for the rent to be reduced? Do you ever see that or not? The rent is automatically increases with inflation. The government could step in and override any document. That's the power of government, but it'd be very unusual to do that. 
I don't, can't think of any instances where I've seen that done. Let's no. say the risk comes more at renewal. Yeah, towards yeah, the end of the contract. We've, we've seen with telecoms is that you know the government consider that that a mobile phone mast is essential to the to the country, and if a landowner now wants it to be removed, it's much much harder for them to. Okay. And they've also reduced the rents to, you know, help the the telecoms companies. It's it's just could that happen? Mm-hmm. And we don't know, but. You know, you want landowners to be able to think of all of these things before they sign up to a really long-term deal. Okay, great. Well, thank you ever so much, Polly and Andrew. Um, I think we've covered the basics and, you know, talked a lot about the process and obviously um, key terms, but also risks. If you do have any further questions, please um, contact Andrew Jenkinson or Polly Saul. Their details are found on the Meet the Team page on our website. Um, We will be launching a a range of other podcasts. Please have a look at our podcast channels. They're available on our website, Spotify, YouTube, etc. And thank you ever so much for listening. If you do want to contact Polly or Andrew, please do so. And hopefully I will um, see you again soon. Many thanks. Goodbye.